What would you do if you accidentally discovered the house next door was occupied by something not human? Personally, I would say, finally, something interesting has moved in. One of my all-time favorites, Tom Holland's cult masterpiece, Fright Night. It's beautiful. Charlie Brewster, not much of an academic, loves horror movies, loves his girlfriend, Amy. He's a typical teenager. Enter the new neighbors, the handsome Jerry and his roommate, Billy. Charlie is automatically curious, a beautiful visitor, a blood curdling scream, pronounced dead, second in two days. But in his naivety, puts himself in the firing line. Now we wouldn't want to wake your mother, would we, Charlie? Then I'd have to kill her too. Right up! It's been said that vampires have become silly, campy, jaded. Nothing had really worked to bring them into the modern age. The 1980s is chock full of creative buggers. You can't go far to see a project with Steven Spielberg's name on it. Vampires were back with a new edge, sophistication, and having some fun at the old tropes. Back, spawn of Satan. <laughs> oh, really? That, of course, meant that any would-be hunter would have to step up their game. This was the brainchild of first-time director Tom Holland. Holland started off as an actor, but later turned to writing. In 1982, The Beast Within, and Class of 1984, the latter where he met Roddy McDowell. Ah! Sit down. Please. Class of 1984 was controversial for its depictions of juvenile gang violence. Today, it's a cult hit. After this came an offer to write a sequel to Psycho, but he needed something that would inspire Anthony to step back into his most famous role. The following is an excerpt from the Psycho 2 commentary. The voice you hear will be Tom Holland. The whole trick going in, Richard and I were trying to, 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 to get it released as a feature. We had faith in the, in the, the attraction of the property, but Universal didn't. It's like, you know, we, we've talked about that the, the, the major corporations have no idea about their, about their catalog or the value mm -hmm. of the catalog or the the relative value of different movies within it. Mm -hmm. And this was one they certainly weren't aware of. Anyway, the trick in writing it was to write a part that was attractive enough that Tony would agree to do it again. Yeah, Universal didn't see, like the other studios, the value in the classics that were are so revered now. Many of Mr. Hitchcock's movies were made at Paramount, but today are distributed by Universal. Paramount, like Warner Brothers, has demonstrated an ignorance streak a mile wide. But I digress. The cast is top-notch. The fresh face trio. William Ragsdale, Amanda Bears, and Stephen Jeffries. Their dynamic at times is dysfunctional, but there's a genuine camaraderie. Even though Ed is a bit of a joker towards Charlie, you can tell there is some affection. In the sequel, he's mentioned as Charlie's best friend. Roddy McDowell, you cannot speak more highly of him. A star since childhood and a walking history book. He and his character were the glue to the whole project. A professional able to portray cowardice and vulnerability with sheer tenacity. Someone so good at their craft that they were able to cry on camera. I can't 
do it alone, Peter. If you don't help, Amy is gonna die. Me too, probably. Please, Peter. I'm sorry, Charlie. The deadly duo of Chris Sarandon and Jonathan Stark. The rapport they have on screen. Not needing to do much except letting Charlie make an ass of himself. Isn't that what vampires are supposed to do, Charlie? <laughs> <laughs> Please. Until it's game time. The discussion about their relationship continues. I would put it to the individual viewer. I'd like to think they're as close as that. Dorothy Fielding, bringing a warmth and a giggle to her character. But wait. <laughs> See this guy? Stuart Stern, and he's on screen for less than 10 seconds. He was a famous screenplay writer. He wrote Rebel Without a Cause. I would be remiss if I didn't mention Art J. Evans and playmate Heidi Sorensen. For first time director, Tom Holland was blessed with an incredible effects team. Steve Johnson, part of Rick Baker's Oscar winning team on American Werewolf in London, here providing some of his best work. Richard Edland, another Oscar winner, famous for making Star Wars and Indiana Jones and had just finished making Ghostbusters with Johnson. It tickles me that a piece that was made for Ghostbusters ended up in Fright Night. Another name before they were famous, Michael Lanterny, with Stan Winston and Dennis Murin was instrumental in the making of Jurassic Park. There's a lot I want to say about the sequel, how it's so underrated, the legal red tape that smothered it after the Menendez murders, leaving it in limbo. Then rising from the many years of crappy copy distribution to finally Blu-ray. If you haven't already, please check out the incredible documentary that lifts the lid on the original movies. I'm not going to talk about the remake or its sequels because there is just no point. They are throwaways. They are errors. I'd like to talk about the many errors in this movie. In that documentary, it talks about how the shark mouth was something whipped up for a few seconds shot. Not knowing that it would become so effective that it would become part of the iconic poster. In recent years, many artists have used that motif for other very famous movies. Thriller, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Psycho, Evil Dead 2, and The Exorcist. I can't speak high enough about Fright Night. Self-aware of what had come before, yet with a gleefully fresh approach. The era of the cool, free-spirited vampire was here. No dusty castles in the mountains with predictable lore attached. They're debonair. They've moved into our towns. Jerry Dandridge was the new vampire. And with future classics like The Lost Boys and Near Dark, ready to mix it up. <laughs> 